So on the measurement side of things, we need to start talking about just how measurement works and where it came from. Measurement really came from a need to communicate. Um, for example, let's say you and I are trying to, to make something that we're both making the same thing and we want it to be identical. Well, if we're in the same room together, it's real easy. We just walk over and mark them off, make sure they're the same size. But if you're across town or the other side of the building even, I need some way to communicate with you how big that is so that we can make them the same size. We could cut a pattern and send the pattern back and forth, but that's very inefficient. It'd be nice to be able to write it down and record it and be able to just have it in writing what size they are. So they may have taken something like this sheet of paper here. We want to make sure both of us have the same size sheet of paper. I might have taken a pen like this one and gone, okay, it's one, two, it's about two and a half pens long. So I send a note to you saying, hey, it's two and a half pens long. Problem is, what happens if it gets to you and you go, okay, here's my pen. One, two, well, two and a half pens for you is way out here. It's very different. So that measurement, that type of communication only works on two circumstances. One, we both have a pen. And two, our pens are the same size, which these two obviously are not. They're very different. So what they started to use was things that pretty much everybody had and were pretty close to the same size from one person to the next. Basically, it was parts of the body. Like an inch for length was defined to be the distance from the end of your thumb to the point of that first knuckle. That's an inch. Now, obviously, everybody's hands are a little bit different size, but they were pretty close to the same from one person to the next. So let's take a peek at length. And we're going to start talking mainly about standard units first. Standard units used to be called the English Standard Measuring System, um, but in the late 1980s, England switched over to the metric system, which, by the way, does leave the United States now as officially the only industrialized country in the world that is not on the metric system. So anyway, standard units of length we'll start out with. I mentioned the inch, and that that inch was the distance from the end of your thumb to the point of that first knuckle. What's our next unit larger than an inch? A foot. Most of us are familiar with a foot as being the next unit. How many inches are in a foot? 12 inches in a foot. <clears throat> now, that wasn't always the case. Um, in the 500s, King Edward declared his thumb and his foot and everything else were going to be the official measurements of the land. So they brought people in, they, they took his thumb and they marked it off on a piece of wood or whatever, and they cut those out and they handed them out for everybody to use. Same with his foot. Up until that point, if I had wanted to measure the height of this wall behind me, I could get up to about here, and maybe with some serious stretching, but there's no way I'm getting all the way up to the top of that wall with my foot. Measuring the height of the wall in inches would have been pretty tedious. So they had other units they used for measuring heights, they used hands. The hand was the width across your hand at the base of the fingers, at the palm. About four inches. Um, any of you that are into horses or livestock, livestock is still measured in hands. You have a 14 and a half hand horse or whatever. It was about four inches. Now, those units still existed, and King Edward's hand was the official hand. But what they discovered is now that you had this piece of wood that was the size of his foot, you could use that for measuring heights. So there were a lot of units that were no longer necessary anymore. So hands were one of them. You know, originally a foot could only be used for measuring things along the ground because that's kind of where feet are. Another unit that kind of went along the, the wayside was one called the cubit. I mean, some of you may have heard that one before. A cubit was from the point of your longest finger to the, the tip of your elbow. That was a cubit. Now, most people now are taller than they were back then, so it's a little bit longer. But back then, a cubit was about 16 inches. Is there anything that you guys know of that uses a lot of things that are 16 inches apart? Think of like floor joists, um, wall studs, old rafter systems. It was a construction unit for building houses and stuff. A cubit was the measure of distance between pretty much everything. Now, again, 
You know, if you're trying to use your foot to measure that out, you'd have to have your foot up there and whatever. So that's why the cubit was used, because it was handy. It was on your arm, it was right there and easy to use. After King Edward declared his foot was going to be the, the, the official foot of the land, it became easier now because we didn't have to use our body parts. You had these measuring devices. Now his foot did not contain exactly 12 of his inches. It was a couple hundred years later. I don't know who it was that decided if I measure something in feet and you measure it in inches, it'd be nice to be able to compare them and see what's longer. So they adjusted the sizes so that they fit together. But up until that point, none of these units could be converted from one to the other. There was no equivalency. So we had the, the hand and the cubit that are no longer used. Bigger than a foot, what's the next unit that we actually use? Yard. How many feet are in a yard? Three feet, good. And again, um, you almost seem surprised that you knew that. Uh, Again, um, there weren't exactly three of King Edward's feet in his yard, but they adjusted it after he was gone. Does anybody know where a yard came from? A lot of people think it's the length of your stride, and it is about, that is about a yard, but the yard actually came from, it is the distance from your outstretched hand to the, either the center of your chest or the tip of your nose. It was a tailor's unit. And if you Go to order fabric at a fabric shop or whatever. You'll see them do that. They'll grab the fabric and go one yard, two yards, and so on. That's how they measured out fabric. Bigger than a yard, there were some units like a fathom. Now, a fathom was used by sailors. It was the shallowest water that most of the larger ships could navigate through without bottoming out. It was about six feet. Um, literally, they would throw one of their taller sailors overboard. And when he hit bottom, I mean, they tied a rope on him. They didn't throw him over there. They lowered him overboard. Um, if the tip of his head showed through the top of the water, it was too shallow to navigate. Hopefully they pulled him back in when they were done, but who knows, right? They don't use the fathom anymore. There is a unit up there that we don't hear a lot about that we are going to talk about a bit. That's a rod. <coughs> a rod is five and a half or 5.5 yards or 16.5 feet. A rod was originally a shepherd's tool. I mean, if you think of a shepherd, there's two tools. There's a rod and a staff. The staff was the little hook, kind of like little Bo Peep had, the little hook. It was for hooking the animals around the neck to detain them, to you know, care for them if they need any treatment, or to shear their wool, catch them to shear their wool and stuff like that. The rod was a defensive weapon. Um, they used it literally to fight off wild animals that were threatening the, the flock. 16 and a half feet. Now that's pretty long. And literally what they did is they just took a sapling tree, they cut it off and debranched it, and that's what they used. If you think about it though, if you're fighting off a wolf with nothing but a big stick, you do want a little bit of distance. So the rod came to be used as a measuring device. Let's say I have sheep and Adrian has sheep and we let them go down into the same valley, and at the end of the day, they say, well, I have 12 sheep, and Adrian goes, well, I have 15, and there's 20 sheep down there. Well, one or both of us is stretching the truth a bit there. So there were a lot of fights that came out of that. Cattle, horses, um, they settled that by branding them. You could look at them and very quickly tell whose was whose. Sheep, that didn't work for a couple of reasons. Um, one, their wool grew out so thick that you couldn't see the brand. Two, and not insignificant, Wool is slightly flammable, so not a good idea to approach them with a hot iron. So there was no way to really mark Ear tags and stuff like that weren't popular yet. So they, it was the beginning of actually lotting off pasture land. So we might find a, a landmark, maybe a big tree or whatever. We'd say, okay, we're going to divide this off. I'm going to pasture my sheep over here. You're going to have your sheep over there. We're going to keep them separate. And of course, there was always arguments, well, your land is bigger than mine or whatever. So literally, they'd take their rod from that landmark and they'd lay, I'd lay my rod down. He'd put his down, then I'd flip mine over and put it and we count one, two, three, four. Okay, it's 40 rods by 100 rods. This one's 40 rods by 100 rods are the same size. To this day, if you look at a legal description for land, land is surveyed in rods. So that's why I bring that one up, is any of you that are ever going to be landowners, um, you will most likely see surveying legal descriptions done in rods. Bigger than a rod, there's furlongs. 
Um, a furlong, I mean, we don't have to write that one down, we're not going to use that. A furlong was the horse, that, the distance that a standard horse could run at full speed before it became winded. It's about an eighth of a mile. The next one that we're going to use is a mile. Does anybody remember how many feet are in a mile? You're close. 5,280. You're blurring feet and yards here. You remember how many yards? It's 1,760 yards. A mile, um, there's a lot of rumors as to where a mile came from. Some say it was the distance King Edward could see out the window from his throne. Um, the most credible explanation for a mile that I've seen comes from the Roman military, the Greek Roman military. The, the word mil, prefix mil, is in, in Greek is a thousand. Um, like for taxes, your mil rate is your price per thousand. So if you have a 22 mil rate, for every thousand dollars of the value, you pay twenty-two dollars in taxes. So a mile was the distance that a Roman soldier could march in formation, doing a thousand paces. Now a pace was starting with your left foot, going to your right foot, and back to your left foot. So you think about that. That's a little over five feet. So about five thousand two hundred eighty feet a mile. So those are our standard units of length. Let's take a look now at capacity. <clears throat> capacity and volume, before we get into the units, we need to talk a little bit about it, are slightly different. A lot of people use them, use those terms interchangeably, and for the most part they are, but volume is found by measuring out three length dimensions. So if you have 8 inches by 14 inches by 7 inches. You multiply up the dimensions to get a volume. And we'll look at calculating volumes in a week or so. A capacity is actually a standard sized container. And what is held in that standard sized container is that unit of capacity. And I think both of them are measuring how much something can contain, how much space is inside of it. It's just a different way of approaching the same thing. Now, in capacities, we'll start with our one of our larger units, a gallon. A gallon actually came from the standard size of a man's hat. Now, I'm not talking about cowboy hats. And we're talking about dress hats, you know, the derby-style hats. Um, standard size is about a gallon. If you ever heard the phrase, a 10-gallon hat, um, there's a little bit of sarcasm to that. Most cowboy hats were considered 10-gallon hats. It's not that they held 10 gallons. It's just it was big. So it's kind of that sarcastic phrase. Well, that's a 10-gallon hat there. It just means it's a bigger hat. <coughs> smaller than a gallon. Anybody know what the next smallest unit is? Quart. How many quarts are in a gallon? There are four. Yeah, the word quart actually came from quarter gallon. So it implies that there are four quarts in a gallon. Smaller than a quart, what do we have? Not in between there, there's a couple. The next one down would be a pint. Good. How many pints in a quart? Two. Yeah. A pint was actually a, a serving glass of, for beer. Beer ale, mostly. Um, a pint, there was not two pints in a quart. They adjusted those sizes at some point along the line. So smaller than a pint. There's one in between there yet. There's a cup. How many cups are in a pint? Two. A cup was actually, you know, the gallon, the, the quart, and the pint were all wet measure, fluid measures, liquids. A cup was actually for dry measurement. It was converted over to fluids after we standardized it. But a cup was actually what you could hold in your cupped hand. So you dump flour or sugars for baking. Whatever you could hold in your hand, that was a cup. Um, if you try it, now my hands are a little bit big, but I have a couple of friends that are caterers. That's what they use for a cup all the time, and I've checked them, and they're dead on just about every time. So. <coughs> Now the cup now can be used, any of these now can be used for dry or liquid because they've been standardized. 
Smaller than a cup. There's a fluid ounce. Everybody know how many fluid ounces are in a cup? Eight. Perfect. A little bit of a warning, by the way. Um, you can see the abbreviation for quart and pint. Quart is QT, pint is PT. In some type fonts, a Q and a P are just mirror images of each other. Um, it is really easy to look at them and if you look real quick to mix them up. Smaller than a fluid ounce. You got it. Tablespoon. Remember how many tablespoons are in a fluid ounce? Two. There are 16 tablespoons in a cup, so two tablespoons in a fluid ounce. Smaller than a tablespoon. Bless you. Yes, there's a teaspoon. Anybody know how many teaspoons? This one switches it up a bit. There are three. Word of warning here. Abbreviation for a tablespoon. I use capital TBSP, but it is also acceptable to use a small TBSP or just a capital TSP or just a capital T. All four of those are acceptable abbreviations for tablespoon. Problem is for teaspoon, acceptable abbreviations are small TSP or just small T. So you can see the problem coming right here. Same letters, the only difference is a capital T. What's that? Helps if you cook, makes it easier to know. Yeah. Um, most modern recipes now, they used to use capital T and small t. But older recipes will use TBSP and TSP. Trust me, it does make a difference if you're making chocolate chip cookies and it says three teaspoons of salt and you read it as tablespoons. I'm a big guy and there was no amount of milk that was going to make me choke those down. As you can tell, I haven't thrown away too many cookies in my life. <clears throat> These next ones you don't have to write down, but there are units smaller than a teaspoon. I know you've all heard them before, but didn't know they were real. One teaspoon contains two dashes. A dash, you think of a salt shaker is what we're used to, but they used to have spice shakers that were a lot bigger than our normal salt shakers are. Same style though, just holes in the top. And a dash was just one tip and kind of a little shake. And what came out, that was a dash of that seasoning. Smaller than a dash, there it is. A pinch. There are three pinches in a dash. Smaller than a pinch, a smidgen, you got it. There are two smidgens in a pinch. Um, a pinch, again, flour, seasoning, or whatever, you stuck your fingers in and you pinch together. Whatever's between your fingers, you put in the recipe. A smidgen, to me, is kind of nasty. Um, you stuck your finger in, whatever stuck to your finger, you put in the recipe. So the cook with really sweaty fingers, the big smidgens, yeah. Yeah, lick your finger first, yeah. They maybe weren't quite as concerned about germs back then. Um, if you go to a baker's shop, you can actually still find measuring spoons for a dash, a pinch, and a smidgen. There are larger units. Um, anybody know what a bushel is? One bushel? How many gallons? Close. Eight. So you're a bushel of corn or a bushel of fruit or whatever. More common for fruit is something called a peck. Here's a Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. There are two gallons in a pack. You don't need to write these down. Uh, if you go to buy strawberries, a strawberry patch or whatever, they have the trays. They'll have the, the one pack and two pack trays. That's what those are. Those are a two pack tray would be four gallons. Anybody know how big a barrel is? 55 is a drum. The drum. One barrel. No heavy, serious drinkers in here? This is Wisconsin. Come on. 31.5 gallons in a barrel. <clears throat> I mean, that's the most common use of a barrel is for beer. A keg is actually a barrel. Um, there's hogshead and stuff like that we're not going to get into. 
So those are our standard units of capacity. Now, I had mentioned at the beginning here, there's capacity and then there is volume. The capacity being a standard size and a volume being you know, put together from those lengths. The relationship between them, one gallon is approximately, I shouldn't put equals, I should put little squiggly equals, 231 cubic inches. Now we haven't done any calculations of volume yet, but a cubic inch is one inch by one inch by one inch, a little block. 231 of those fit into a gallon. Here's the one that usually surprises people. A cubic foot, that's one foot by one foot by one foot. Now, most of you have seen a five-gallon bucket. Would you say a five-gallon bucket is more or less than a cubic foot? You say it's more than a cubic foot? Most people would. A five-gallon bucket is taller than a foot, but the bottom's only about nine inches across. And the fact that it's rounded cuts out a lot of volume. It's only about nine inches across on the, on the inside, on the bottom. <coughs> One cubic foot is actually about 7.48 or 7.5 gallons. I can't remember what your textbook uses. We're off to say 7.48. So one five-gallon bucket is only about two-thirds of a cubic foot. I would have said the same thing the first time I thought about that. Ah, five-gallon bucket is bigger than a cubic foot, but it's not. Okay. So that is capacity and a little bit of volume. We'll look at volumes later on in the next couple of weeks, actually calculating volumes from those links and stuff like that. The next units we want to talk about require a little bit of explanation, kind of like capacity and volume. It is mass and weight. Most people are very familiar with the word weight, um, but in many cases what they're talking about is actually a mass. Mass is defined to be the amount of matter in an object. Literally, how much stuff, how much material is in that object? Weight is the force of gravity on an object. There's obviously a relationship between them. The more mass something has, the more gravity is going to pull on it. The difference is in how they are measured. Weight is measured using a scale. What a scale does is, is a spring. You take a spring from, from rest, and if you stretch it, the, the amount it stretches is exactly related to the amount of force that is applied to it. So what you do is you take a spring, and they'll hang. That spring will be surrounded by a box of some sort that has a numbered scale on it. There will be an indicator on that spring is how far it's stretched. So that indicator would start at zero if there's nothing on that spring. So as we hang our object on that spring, the spring is going to stretch and that indicator will move. Where that indicator is, we read that off that numbered scale again and that tells us how far the spring stretched and how much force gravity is pulling on that object. Mass is measured with what is called a balance. A balance, kind of like a teeter-totter. You put the object that we're trying to measure on one end, and on the other side, you put known masses until it balances. So when it balances, whatever this known mass is, is the mass of our object. Now, you might be thinking about that, well, what's the difference? Well, if I go to the moon, the, gra the weight is dependent on the force of gravity. Now, you might be thinking, well, use gravity for measuring mass, too, but it's not dependent on it. Let me show you what I mean. When you go to the moon, gravity on the moon is one-sixth of gravity on Earth. So the amount that spring is going to stretch is going to be a lot less. So the weight of that object is going to be one-sixth on the moon. The mass, well, the force of gravity pulling on that object is going to change, but the force of gravity pulling on the known mass is going to change as well. So it will still be the exact same mass that balances out. So the mass does not depend on the force of gravity. 
So mass is a constant for that object, period. It seems very subtle, but yes, sir, you think you got a question coming up? Because it's got less mass and it's a little bit smaller. Um, it's actually more because it's closer to the Earth. Depending on which side of the moon you're on, the gravity of the moon changes. The amount of gravity you feel changes greatly. Now on Earth, gravity is relatively constant um, from one place to another. If you're looking at the globe, yes, I realize I didn't make that round because it is actually slightly oval shaped. Gravity is slightly more at the poles and slightly less at the equator. But for, let's say you have a 200 pound person, it maybe be about a one pound difference from the equator to the poles. Maybe at the most a two pound difference. It's less than 1%, put it that way. <coughs> so because gravity is relatively constant on Earth, we tend to use mass and weight interchangeably. When we're talking about standard measurement, we tend to talk about weight. When we're talking about metric measurement in a little bit, we tend to talk about mass. And when we do conversions, we convert back and forth from one to the other without considering the fact that they're two different things. So in the standard measurement system, there is a unit of mass. It is called a slug. You ever hear somebody use the word, oh, you bought a whole slug of these, or I have a whole slug of those out in the shed? That's where that word came from. Um, one slug weighs about 32 pounds. If you were converting it, you know, that, the mass on Earth of one slug would be about 32 pounds on Earth. That is our only unit of mass in the standard system. We're looking at weight. We'll start out with the large units again for weight. The ton. How big is a ton? 2,000 pounds is what we're used to saying. 2,000 pounds is actually what is called one net or short ton. Now, if it's a net or short ton, that implies there's something called a gross or a long ton. And there is. It is 2,240 pounds. The difference is, um, if you think about your paycheck, if you make $10 an hour and you work 40 hours in a week, you've earned $400. That would be your gross. Do you actually get a check for $400? No. They take out taxes and other stuff. You might get like 250 bucks. That would be your net. That's what you actually get. <coughs> Similar concept here. The ton was originally used for buying and selling grain. You couldn't just put a ton of a grain on a scale. It would slide off the edges. So you had to have it in a container. The container that contained a ton of grain was about 240 pounds. <coughs> so the gross weight with the container was 2,240 pounds. The weight of the grain itself was about 2,000 pounds. 99.9999% of the time, when you hear the word ton, they're going to be talking about 2,000 pounds. In this class, on a quiz or a test, I will never use a long ton. It will always be a short or net ton. Always 2,000 pounds in here. Just be aware that there is another ton, a gross ton out there. Not to be confused, there's also something called a gross, which is a dozen dozen, which is a little bit different. It's not a unit of weight, it's just a number. <coughs> so, smaller than the ton, of course, is the pound. It would make sense to abbreviate pound PD. Unfortunately, in the bookkeeping system for buying and selling grain, PD was already used as the abbreviation for paid. Very good. So they used the Latin word for pound, which was Libra. So they use LB to abbreviate pound. What is our next unit smaller than a pound? It's also one of our capacity units. Ounces. How many ounces are in a pound? 16. The abbreviation for an ounce. 
Since they use the Latin word for pound, they also use the Latin word for ounce. So the abbreviation is OZ. And right now for the life of me, I can't remember what that Latin word is. That's why it's OZ instead of ON or OC or OS or anything like that. Unit smaller than an ounce. Some of you have probably heard this, but didn't probably thought it was metric. It's a dram. One ounce contains 16 drams. A dram was one of the original apothecary units. You might be prescribed a quarter of a dram of medication, or an eighth of a dram of medication. <coughs> Smaller than a dram, there was a grain. There were 7,000 grains in one pound. They didn't really use an equivalency between grains and drams or grains and ounces. They went straight to pounds. Um, for, grains were used for measuring medication. In fact, grains were so popular for measuring medications that they absorbed grains into the metric system for the medical side of things. Not very well either, by the way. They screwed up the size. They changed the size of a grain for the metric side of it. Um, also, any of you that ever got into reloading your own shells for for shooting or anything like that for, for bullets. Your gunpowder and everything else is measured out in grains. <coughs> now, this next part you don't need to write down. You won't be tested on it. There are units out there. You hear all the time about, on the news, gold has reached $1,700 an ounce and all that. Well, Remember I said King Edward said, declared that his thumb and foot and everything would be the official measurements of the land? That happened in other areas as well. Different rulers declared their thumb and their foot to be the official measurements of their kingdom. So the problem with standard measurement is from one area to the next, it was anything but standard. The center in the world for buying and selling precious metals like gold, silver, and others was in the island of Troy in the Mediterranean Sea. They had their own pound and ounce that they used. So when we buy and sell precious metals, to this day, we tend to use Troy measurements. In the Troy measuring system, one Troy pound is about 0.82 U.S. pounds. So a Troy pound is considerably smaller than a standard pound, a U.S. pound. However, one troy pound contains only 12 troy ounces. So a troy ounce is actually slightly bigger than our standard ounce. Now again, you'll never be tested on those. But just you hear so much about precious metals, I wanted to let you know that those are actually slightly different measurements. That they use. Okay, next on our list, we've got weight, volume, length, capacity, Time, I'm not going to talk about because I'm assuming you guys all know 60 minutes in an hour, 60 seconds in a minute, and all that stuff. <coughs> so let's look at converting. If I asked you to convert three feet into inches, most of you can tell me off the top of your head that's going to be what? How much? 36. There we go. 36 inches. If you didn't know that, though, the way you could convert that would look like this. Take your three feet, make it into a fraction by putting it over one. Then we use a conversion factor. This conversion factor works off of the same concept we did for working with fractions several weeks ago. If I had three-fourths and I wanted to change its name, I could multiply by five over five. 3 times 5 is 15, 4 times 5 is 20. 15 twentieths has exactly the same value as 3 fourths. It just looks different. The reason that worked was 5 over 5 is equivalent to what? 1. And when you multiply by 1, it doesn't change the value of anything. It just changes the appearance. I'm going to do a similar thing over here. Now I'm getting rid of feet. I want to get rid of feet. So I'm going to put feet on bottom so that in my fractions when I multiply, they will cross cancel out. I'm changing it into inches, so I'm going to put inches on top. 
What's our relationship between feet and inches? Well, one foot equals 12 inches. Now that doesn't look like it equals one, but it does. 12 inches and one foot are exactly the same value, the same length. So even though it looks weird, it is still equal to one. So the feet do cancel out. We have three times 12 inches is 36 inches. One times one is one, so it's 36 inches over one, or just 36 inches. <clears throat> Now, as we said, with feet and inches, we probably didn't need to do that. But let's say I have 99 feet, and I want to convert it into rods. That's one you most likely don't know off the top of your head. So to do that conversion, take 99 feet, put it over 1. I'm going to put feet on bottom so that, again, they'll cross-cancel out in our fractions. And rods on top. What's the relationship between feet and rods? One rod equals 16 and a half, 16.5 feet, right? So the feet will cancel out, cross cancel out. 99 times one rod is 99 rods. One times 16.5 is 16.5. We divide that out. 99 divided by 16.5 is 6. 99 feet is 6 rods. So we can do these conversions like that. In fact, we can do multiple conversions. Let's say I wanted to know four rods is how many inches? So my four rods over one, my conversion factor, rods are going to go on bottom so they cancel out. Do I have a direct conversion from rods to inches? No, I don't. But I can go from rods to feet. One rod, 16.5 feet. At this point, the rods have canceled out. And we're in feet. But I don't want it in feet. I want it in inches. So I'm going to put feet on bottom so they cancel out. Inches on top. One foot is 12 inches. So now the feet cancel out. So on top here, I'm going to multiply across 4 times 16.5 times 12, 792 inches. On bottom, 1 times 1 times 1 is just 1. So that divides out to 792 inches. So you can see I could do more than one conversion right in a row at the same time to get to where I need to go. Um, this gets used a lot with capacity. Let's say we have 64 cups. I want to know how many gallons that is. Well, I put my 64 cups over 1. We have no direct conversion from cups to gallons. But I can go from cups to pints. One pint is two cups. Cups cancel out. We're now in pints. But we don't want pints. So I'll put pints on bottom. The next step up the ladder, we got an equivalency between pints and quarts. One quart is two pints. Now the pints cancel out in our fractions. We are in quarts. But again, we don't want to be quarts. <clears throat> so put quarts on bottom. Or we can go to gallons. One gallon. Let's just use L out of T. One gallon is four quarts. So the quarts have now canceled out. And what we have was gallons, which is what we were looking for. So we've got 64 times 1 times 1 times 1 gallon is 64 gallons. On bottom, we have 1 times 2 times 2 times 4 is 16. That divides out to 4 gallons. What do you think? Not bad? Okay. <coughs> In the metric system, We have only one unit for each thing. And the metric system was actually developed in the 1890s. So it's been around a lot longer than most people think it has. When they did the metric system, they looked at the standard system. And there were a lot of problems with it. You know, as we said, every area 
standardize their measurements different. Different rulers declare their thumb and foot and whatever. So a foot was far from standard. It was different lengths from one area to another. So they, they needed to come up with a system for trading internationally between countries. You know, whose foot were they going to use or whatever. So they developed the metric system specifically developed for international trade. <coughs> they, they'd been using the standard system for literally centuries at that point. So they knew what was kind of flawed in the standard system and they knew what worked really well in the standard system. So they were able to plan it out. You know, the standard system, inches and feet and all that were never meant to work together. They forced them to work together at some point. The metric system, they planned it out a little better to be more convenient. So in the metric system, our unit of length is a meter. A meter is about 39.4, it's like 39.37 inches. Now a yard is 36 inches. It would have been really convenient if a meter equaled a yard, wouldn't it? Would have made it a lot simpler. Well, as I said, a, those units were different from one country to another. And the meter was actually based off the Swiss yard. So a meter is equal to a Swiss yard. <coughs> Just not the U.S. yard. Abbreviation for a meter is a small m. If I want something smaller than a meter, there's prefixes for that. Deci is one-tenth. So a decimeter is abbreviated DM. That's one-tenth of a meter. The prefix centi is one-one-hundredth. A centimeter, abbreviated CM, is one-one-hundredth of a meter. Milli, oops. Milli is one one thousandth. So a millimeter is abbreviated MM. That's a thousandth of a meter. Now you can see there they went every ten. Ten hundred thousand. After that they didn't do that anymore. They skipped the ten thousand and hundred thousands and they jumped straight to a millionth. A millionth was a micro. Now the abbreviation for micro, I'll draw it out a little bit larger up here for you. Look like that is the Greek letter mu. M was already used for milli, so they used mu for micro. So a micrometer, abbreviated mu m, is a millionth of a meter. If you're going in the medical fields or if you work with the medical fields at all, they have their own abbreviation for micrometer, MCM. The reason for that is the medical fields are one of the first fields to store all their data electronically on computers. So they had to keyboard all their information into a computer. Um, to abbreviate micro with a mu, there is no mu key on the computer. So it was really a pain to enter that into the computer. So they used to start using the MCM for micrometer, MCL for microliter and all that. There is one smaller, it's called nano. A nano would be a billionth of a meter. About five or six years ago, you heard a lot about nanotechnology, nanoscience. A nanometer is about the size of one atom. So nanoscience is just talking about things that are really small. If you go larger than a meter, deca is 10. Now for decameter, decimeter is already dm, so decameter is going to be dam. That's 10 meters. Next is, next is hecto, which is 100. So HM is a hectometer, which is 100 meters. Kilo is 1,000. So a kilometer is KM, that's 1,000 meters. Now just like on the other side, we went 10 hundreds, thousands here. We didn't go 10,000, we skipped the 10,000, 100,000. And we went right up to the million. which is mega. Now you can see I spelt mega with a capital M. That's because when we abbreviate mega, it's a capital M, little m is megameter. <clears throat> the cool thing about the metric system, you can see going from one unit to the next, it's all either multiplying or dividing by 10. 
Well, what happens to a number when you multiply or divide it by 10? Just like with our percents, it just moves the decimal point over a spot, right? So if I am converting in the metric system, let's say I have 2.3 meters, and I want to convert it into centimeters. Well, meters to centimeters is two spots to the right on the chart. To convert it, I move the decimal point two spots to the right. Filling in a zero there, that's 230 centimeters. If I have 600 millimeters, and I want to convert them into meters. From millimeters to meters is three spots to the left on my chart. My decimal point has to move three spots to the left. One, two, three. That is 0.6 millimeters. What do you think? For capacity, our main unit is a liter. Don't be shocked if you see it spelt like this. L-I-T-R-E instead of T-E-R. That's European spelling. It's catching on over here for some reason. Leader, I was always taught that leader was abbreviated with a capital L. The reason for that was when I learned the metric system, it was the late 1980s. Um, a lot of your type fonts, the small one or the small L and the one were identical. You couldn't tell the difference between them. So they used a capital L. So if you had something like this, is that 51 or is that 5 liters? Well, if you use a capital L, it's very clear that's 5 liters. Now with the, some of the modern type fonts, there is a difference between an L and a 1, so that it's okay to use a small L. You'll see me always use a capital L, or pretty much always use a capital L, just because that's what I'm used to. And also, I want to make it clear what I'm writing up here. So just like with meters, there's deciliters, which is a tenth of a liter, centiliters, which is a tenth of a, a hundredth of a liter, and milliliter, which is a thousandth of a liter. There's a microliter, which is a millionth of a liter. Medical field, we call that MCL for microliter. <coughs> Larger, there's decaliter, D-A-L, is 10 liters. Hectoliter is 100 liters. Kiloliter is 1,000 liters. And again, we skip up to a million would be megaliter. That's capital M for mega again. In practice, for either of these units and for the ones coming up for mass, the main unit caught on, the meters and the liters caught on. Milli was used a lot, and kilo was used not so much for liters, but definitely for meters. The units in between kind of fell by the wayside. You don't see hecto and deca used for anything. For lengths, the centimeter caught on in the United States, mainly because it's the closest thing in the metric system to our inch. And we were so ingrained with inches that we kind of latched on to the centimeter. Decimeters, you don't see used for hardly anything either. Volume, deciliters do get used in the medical field, blood tests. Uh, if you ever have your cholesterol checked and they say it's a 130, that is 130 milligrams of triglycerides per deciliter of blood, what that say? Blood sugar, same way. If they say you've got a, an 85 blood glucose reading, that's 85 milligrams of glucose per deciliter of blood. Let's talk about... Now let's talk about weight here for just a second. In the metric system, they tend to focus on mass. The unit of weight in the metric system is called a newton. That's probably the last time you'll hear the term newton out of my mouth. It is the one unit in the metric system that does not work real well. They tend to focus on mass in the metric system. And in mass, the main unit of mass is a gram. So smaller, again, is decigram, centigram, milligram, skipping down to microgram. Larger is decagram, hectogram, kilogram, again, skipping up to megagram. A gram is about the size of a medium-sized paper clip. A megagram, by the way,
has been defined as one metric ton, and it's more commonly known rather than a megagram as a thousand kilograms. <coughs> now that we have, all, of course, the conversions are the same. You're just moving decimal places on the chart. Now, we've got these three different measurements, mass, capacity, and length. In the standard system, there was no relationship between them, very loose relationship. There's, there's a, they had to really force it. In the metric system, they planned this. So in the metric system, one milliliter was defined to be a cube that was one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter. In other words, a milliliter is equal to one cubic centimeter. So it's a pretty slick transition there. One gram was defined to be the mass of one milliliter of water. So if you're measuring water, if you know its volume, you know its mass. So it's a very smooth transition. Okay, I'm a few minutes past our break, so let's go ahead and take a break. Let's come back at about 4.33 to start our second.